more importantly, I, I enjoy the, the fact that we get into the Word of God. So it's, it's a fantastic, fantastic thing to do. So, but let's go ahead and before we start our study, let's go ahead and open with a word, word of prayer this morning. Lord, we thank you. Um, we praise you for this opportunity and this time that we have. We understand that uh, you loved us, you died for us, you rose again for our justification, and you gave us your word so that we might understand you. And so, Father and Lord, we just come to you and we just thank you for this, the fact that we live in a country that we can come together and study. Uh, we pray for this study, we pray for this nation, we pray for those who can't be with us. And you know that the different requests. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Okay. Uh, if you got your hand out here, we left off um, looking at the, going to start looking at the law and circumcision. Most of us are, I'm sure, very familiar that circumcision was uh, required under the law. It was something that was not optional for for the children of Israel. Uh, so you had Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and once, once the law was given through Moses, um, circumcision was actually given before, before then. But um, you actually have part of the law, part of the, the Mosaic covenant was circumcision. It was not an option. It was required. There was no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It was, it was a requirement for that covenant relationship. Um, and so... As we're, we're, as we're talking about rightly dividing, and again, if you weren't here last week um, or the week before, the reason we're teaching this is because almost everything that we teach, um, message-wise, is somehow affected by this. I don't care what we teach, it's going to be affected. We may not necessarily reference it, but it is going, going to be affected. Later, we're, we're still doing the names of God, and we're looking at uh, Jehovah Rohi, which is the Lord... Uh, Lord, my shepherd. Uh, I can tell you there's huge ramifications, or I should say um, aspects of rightly dividing and looking at the Lord, my shepherd. Um, and almost everything that we look at has it. And so you'll hear me reference uh, rightly dividing or, uh, or something. And so before we moved on to our next study in Sunday school to a book of the Bible, whether it's Corinthians or Thessalonians or whatever, um, I wanted to go over this because, again, as we do a verse-by-verse -verse study, uh, we approach the Scriptures from a, a, a particular bent. And that is, is, one, we take God at His Word. Mm -hmm. you know, he's not a liar. He's not a deceiver. He's not here to try to trick us up and, and try to get us to fail. His desire is to see us succeed. He, he's not the author of confusion. And so we approach <coughs> it with understanding His character. We approach the Word of God and we approach the studies from the idea that he revealed his will to us and he wants us to understand it. And we also approach it that we take his instructions in a normal, literal sense. Um, we don't want our children, when we give them instructions on don't do this, you don't want them to spiritualize that and say, well, I didn't think you really meant that. I thought you were actually meaning this. No, when you give instructions, you, you tend to make them clear, understandable. But when we approach the scriptures, that's how we, we, we treat God, that whenever he says, don't do this, then he means don't do this. If he says that this is allowed, um, that doesn't mean that in the past that it was really allowed, but he was trying to trick you. Um, or in this case with circumcision, whenever he said it was required, a requirement of the flesh, and because of later, now we see that it's not required, we don't try to turn it the old one as in, well, he didn't really mean it was required or that it wasn't required in the flesh. The people just misunderstood. No, we understand when we rightly divide that those were instructions for Israel and we have ours. And so when we look at rightly dividing, these are just a few of the things, again, looking at the sheet, that, that we can see that uh, are affected by rightly dividing. We live in a world, um, we live in a world where the church, and when I say the church, um, I'm not talking about cult groups. I'm talking about real believers. People who are in the body of Christ are very confused. And they're very confused because they're not following the instructions that they were given. They're trying to mix oil and water, which is the same thing as trying to mix prophecy and mystery. 
And so that's why these things become important, so that we can truly understand what it is that's meant for us and not, one, be confused, and two, not look like hypocrites to a world that seems to think that we're, we're picking and choosing things at some random basis because they'll see one church teach this and another church teach this and think that's justification for everybody having their own opinion. Does that make sense? And what I mean by that, we see churches today that teach the idea that God is love. He loves everybody. So, yeah, John, you can love Peter and you can get married. Well, you may think that's far-fetched far -fetched for me to make that connection. But how do we get to the, this point? We get to this point by one small step, moving ourselves away from the Word of God. And if we let the Bible be the authority and we let God mean what He says and we stop trying to turn it into something else and we just take God at His Word, these things make sense. And so that's a systematic theology um, that we call you know, right division. Uh, Mid-Acts dispensationalism, dispensationalism are different key words. And when it comes to right division, to be honest with you, uh, we don't own that term, right division. And what I mean by that is you'll see many groups out there talking about they rightly divide. But they don't necessarily do it the way that we say that it should be done. And so it's up to you to be convinced in your own mind what right division really is. I'm here to tell you what I believe is right and um, from my studies, but in the end, you've got to see if, if, if the scriptures back up what I'm saying here. Hold me, hold me accountable, hold me to the test, ask the questions. Don't assume what I'm saying is right any more than you assume anybody else's, um, what they're saying. But there are a lot of churches out there that will talk about right division. Um, they might divide, uh, where we divide between prophecy and mystery. We talked about that last week between the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which is what Paul says, versus preaching Jesus Christ, which was preached since the world began, which is what Peter does. Now, so we separate between prophecy and mystery. There are those who teach rightly dividing, and they separate from before Pentecost and after Pentecost. There are those who do it before uh, the resurrection and after, or before the cross or after, or before the birth of Jesus and after. And so there's different variants of what rightly dividing means. And so don't think that just because we use that term that um, you won't hear others say that they rightly divide as well. But what do they mean by it? So you can't just you know, move and say, I'm looking for a church that rightly divides, and they say, yep, we rightly divide. Well, what do you mean by rightly dividing. Are you rightly dividing, you know, in the right way? And so it's important to find out what the Bible's talking about and uh, how we should rightly divide. it. I believe uh, wholeheartedly that the division that Paul talks about, because he says over and over again that, that he was made a minister and a dispensation of the mystery. And so the things that he preaches, he says, was not given to me by man. I got it directly by God in a revelation. I was made a minister and given a dispensation of this mystery. And so um, all of that is kind of introduction as to if you weren't here last week or the week before, uh, where we're going in this study. Any comments or questions? Okay, very good. Glad you guys all agree with me. <laughs> all right, turn with me to Acts chapter 15, verse 1. Here we're looking at the issue of circumcision. And as I said, circumcision was, was considered uh, a requirement Let's see if I can't use this. I guess somebody saw that I was constantly looking at my fingers to move the pages and they got me some of this stuff here. Let's see if it works. I hope so. But circumcision, like I said, did the Old Testament say it was required? That's one of the questions. Did Peter and the Twelve, after the cross, resurrection, and uh, the ascension, and after Pentecost, did they continue to teach that circumcision was a requirement? To the Jews, yeah. they did. Sure they did. Yeah, right. to the Jews. Exactly right. Uh, they certainly did. And so what should that 
tell us? Well, if Paul's saying circumcision avails nothing, but yet, as we're going to see here in, in Acts chapter 15, which is many years into Paul's ministry, it's not like it was, you know, the week after Paul was saved. We're talking about many years after Paul's ministry had begun. In Jerusalem, they're still teaching the law and circumcision. And what should that tell us? Well, it tells us, for one thing, that the message that Peter is preaching and Paul are pre is preaching are two different ones. And we have to understand that because then when you go read the book of Peter and the book of John, then you can see why those things don't coincide with what Paul says. And instead of changing what James says about that you're justified by works, we can say, oh, well, that just wasn't to us. And it makes sense. But let's look here at uh, Acts chapter 15, verse 1. It says, And certain men which came down from, where? Judea. Judea, Judea. Taught the, who? Brethren. Brethren. And said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. And so here we have a, a dispute over circumcision, and ultimately the law of Moses. Telling these, these people, which uh, Paul is dealing with, that you have to be circumcised. And most people lo lose that last word in there. What is it? You cannot be what? Saved, saved. So it's not about the issue. The question isn't whether or not you should do it because Jesus thought it was a good thing. No, it's whether your salvation depends upon this. This is the question that's at hand. That, that brings this to a huge level. Because salvation is a very big issue here. And so Paul says, Paul's saying, no, you don't have to do it. Here these people are coming and they're saying you have to do it in order to get saved. Drop down to verse 4. And Paul and, and uh, Barnabas, they, they head up to Jerusalem because they're not going to have any of this. And it says, And when they came to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and elders. Now, the apostles and elders are obviously those of the Jerusalem church. So it would be Peter, the other apostles, and the, other, uh, and the elders. And they declared all things that God had done with them, meaning Paul and Barnabas. But the, there rose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees, which what? What does it say? Believe. What does it mean, believed here? Believed exactly what the twelve were teaching. So it wasn't like in Jesus' day where Jesus was teaching and the Pharisees who were unbelievers in Jesus came to dispute. This is talking specifically about Pharisees who were at Jerusalem who were believers who followed the teaching that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. So, Would that be like a Messianic uh, sect, Messianic Jews? Yeah, I mean, what we see today as Messianic Jews would be very similar. Um, you know, these, these here are those who are, who, are, who are being taught by the Twelve. And what is the teaching? That, that Jesus is the Messiah, that He is the Christ, that He is the Son of God, that He is the Anointed One, and that He's going to come back to... To set up his kingdom. So when you read what Peter says in Acts chapter 2 and 3, you men of Judea, uh, when he's talking about you men of Israel, that if you do this, then Jesus will come back. These are the people that believe that message. So when it says that, that they were believers, um, we have to keep in mind, these weren't unbelievers who were disagreeing with Peter. This is the people who did agree with Peter. Um, and it says, So there rose up certain of the Pharisees which believed, saying that it was needful to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Well, the question that's before, well, let's read verse 6. And the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. And I tell you, that's a huge verse right there in itself. Because if Peter and the, the other eleven had been teaching the same message this whole time, why would they even stop to consider that? Imagine if somebody came in today and said, you know, pastor, pastor, church, you have to keep the law of Moses. Would we have to come together to consider that? No. We already know that you don't, right? And so if Peter and the Twelve have... have um, have been teaching this whole time that yes, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, there's no need to do this, when this group got up and said that you had to follow the law of Moses to be saved, they would have instantly rebuked that unless, under only one circumstance, 
if they were still teaching it themselves. The fact that you had to follow the law of Moses. It's the only scenario that fits. And if you got another one, I'd be happy to hear it. But uh, what do we see here? This, this group comes up and says that you have to, that it was needful to circumcise and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders came together to consider this matter. And so uh, it, it would be kind of, like I said, kind of silly to think that they, they themselves weren't teaching it. Drop down to verse 23. Here we have the instructions that after they had their conversation, <coughs> Paul and Barnabas with the rest of them, here we have the instructions that uh, were given by the Jerusalem church, and it says, And they wrote letters by them after this manner. The apostles and elders and brethren sent greeting unto the brethren which are of the Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. For as much as we have heard that certain which went out from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, saying you must be circumcised and keep the law, to whom we gave no such commandment. And that's usually the out. From everything I just said, that's usually the out. That's, that some person that doesn't agree with us uh, rightly dividing, they'll say, see, they didn't tell them to do it. Well, we agree that the 12 didn't send them, but it still doesn't make any sense why they, why they, would, why they would be teaching that um, to Gentiles if they weren't still teaching it for the Jews in Israel. It does, just doesn't make sense. So obviously, the Jews in Israel were still under the belief that they had to follow the law themselves. Here, you have all that, all that Peter is saying is, we didn't send them to you to tell you this. But yet we know that they, they had to come together to consider whether or not the Gentiles should have to follow the law. Well, why would they consider if the Gentiles had to follow the law if they themselves weren't still following the law? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't make sense, tell me, and I'll, I'll try to word it in a different sense, but it just comes clear to me that, that these, these, this group here is following the law of Moses still. And again, I would remind you, this is many years into Paul's ministry. And remember, Paul wasn't saved until probably around seven years after Christ ascended. Well, apparently even to modern day. I mean, because I've not been... Uh, I guess I haven't had exposure to this rightly divided, although it's been alluded to in a, in a couple of churches that we've been to. And um, I, I, when you ask why, when, we, when you when you sit, just to back up about somebody coming in and presenting this, uh, you know, this doctrine or a, mm -hmm. a different doctrine, I started to agree that it depended on the validity of who it was that was sure. presenting it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I was thinking, well, yeah, you know, you may want to consider it depending on who it is, because these are learned people, and there are a lot of learned people that we have uh, uh, tutel tutelage, you know, by, yeah, trusted, really, literally trusted. So I ask, why, <clears throat> why does this, why is this happening? Like, why is it because they're, you know, it's their own agenda, it's man's understanding, and they're using it, et cetera, Whereas this is the actual word of God. Is that nutshell is what I'm hearing? Because there, there's a lot of it out there. Say that again. I'm not sure I truly understood the question. The, the, Val did, because I heard her say that was a good question. So. Right. Well, why? <laughs> Thanks. Why? You, you brought up why. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of people, very intelligent people, very learned people, mm -hmm. very the theologically trained people mm -hmm. that don't agree with this necessarily or don't. Preach it, or right? Teach, teach it. it, yeah. Well, and, and again, I think that uh, one of the things that's very common in society when it comes to mankind, and certainly in the church, that traditions oftentimes weigh in people's um, opinions more so than the scriptures themselves. Right. You know, again, we all we are humans. We're sentimental. Sometimes we can get our judgment clouded by the fact that, and I use this reference all the time, you mean to tell me my grandpa was wrong all these years? People, nobody wants to hear that the grandpa who loved and nurtured them was wrong all this time. And so it's easier just to turn the blind's eye to it. Um, and so with you know, understanding that, I tell you what, um, there's nothing that I learned without... Um, 
you know, something before me. In other words, whether it's the Word of God or men like Whitey uh, or Dr. Bedore uh, uh, or my <coughs> pastor back in St. Louis or many of the different people I've read their, read their books, I don't owe my knowledge to myself on any level. Everything that I've learned, I've learned from somebody else. And so, you know, it's not prideful. We shouldn't, we shouldn't look at it in a prideful sense that, that I'm, you know, uh, it's got to be... It's got to be what I already believe, what my family believe. We're supposed to be aligned to the truth, and I, I just think that a lot of a lot of this world isn't so much aligned to the truth. And that's what I what I mean by that is, is accepting a new teaching. You know, people not wanting to hear. You know, well, what does it actually say? Not what tradition says. So one sec, Kevin. And so yeah, I mean, there are those that 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 don't teach it, but why? Because they're still holding on to the traditions they were taught. Mm. And I'm talking about, you know, again, I don't want to name names or groups or, or different denominations, but Paul even makes it very clear. Paul says at the end of his ministry, just about everybody abandoned him. Mm. And he's talking about his teaching. Mm. So why would I play emphasis on second century or third century so-called early church fathers? If, if those, you know, who were, who were still alive, who were alive with Paul, if most of them, which Paul named some of them, had already abandoned his teaching, um, it's no surprise that we see that uh, for a long time many people did. And so, yeah, I, again, we got to just come back to what the Bible says. Does that answer your question at all? Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, I don't, I mean, <clears throat> the more I understand, the more it makes sense. And uh, so I'm not in disagreement sure. with you. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, so it was it just does. a curiosity as to why traditions. Yeah, yeah. G generally, it's traditions. So it's traditions. It's about man's own agenda. Mm -hmm. It's about um, well, on the bad, really bad side, it's about power and influence and right, mm -hmm. all that. Yeah, popularity. Right. Yeah, and, and and again, I I don't want to to, and I will get to you, Kevin, in a second here. And I don't want to. I'm not trying to judge harshly the hearts of of people. I know that there are teachers out there that who who don't agree and their love for the Lord is real right um, and, and it's between them and God to to accept what God's Word says uh, but I just know that whenever I take what God says in a normal way God says what he means and it may we got to fit we got to fit our theology into the scriptures and not fit our scriptures into our theology mm -hmm. and that's the problem that most people have so Kevin. Thank you. And then Tim. I want to start something, you know, you got to be circumcised to be saved. You know, well, we know that you got to be circumcised to become part of the Jewish nation. Mm -hmm. But it says to be saved, you know, you want to well, save from what? Death, hell, and the devil? Or save from the wrath to come? Or, you know, because a lot of times you'll ask somebody, oh, are you saved? And they want to, <laughs> what do you mean? Someone asked me, well, what are you saved from when you say you're saved? Right? I could just say, well, I'm just saved from myself. Yeah. But, you know, that's a big uh, idea. Well, what, is it, what does it mean to be saved? You know, you got to do this, this, and they're trying to say you got to do this to be saved. And it's, it's like, well, what are we saved from, you know? Sure. Well, I know it's, you know, saved from death. Yep. we got the victory over death now. And Amen. And it just comes very simple to, you know, we all had that problem of death because of Adam. And Jesus came down and he took care of the problem Amen. for us, you know. Sure. Yeah. Eternal life, it's hard to know because you keep us getting older and closer. <laughs> you know, what are you yeah. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, sometimes saved is, you have to make sure that you're paying attention to the context because saved isn't always talking about the same thing. Paul talks about the fact that, that us, the body of Christ, were saved from the wrath to come. Well, saved in that context is talking about the tribulation, God's wrath on mankind specifically as it relates to that. And so there are times in which saved is talking about different things, and which is why you, know, you have to study to, to make sure that you're comparing Scripture, putting things in context, and, and ascribing to God the correct attributes. Tim and then you, because last time I put you before him, I didn't get back to him. So. <laughs> well, you had your priorities correct, Pastor. <laughs> um, now, <laughs> relating back uh, to what Derek said, um, one of the biggest issues and problems I have in talking to people who haven't to date uh, rightly divided but have gone to church, are Christians and everything, is 
they say, no, that's too simple. Yeah. Why, why is it coming out now for the first time? I mean, there are smarter people than you who yeah. have. Uh, Trust me, I've been told that. Um, <laughs> who have, you know, glossed over that. So you have to be wrong. I mean, that's uh, that is such a common response now. And I said, well, you know, Satan's pretty strong on this earth, and he blinds a lot of people and prevents them from seeing what, what the truth is, and uh, why do you think it says uh, the Bereans, uh, you know, were noble? Because they studied the scriptures daily, and how many Christians, church-going people, truly study the scriptures daily? Right. They, mm -hmm. they fall into their routines, mm -hmm. and they, you know, they might do it you know, Sunday or once a week or something, or they read a commentary uh, about it uh, yeah, right. rather than actual... Or a devotional, you know, my little five-minute devotional, which is nothing wrong with it, right. but it can't be a replacement, so yeah. 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 Well, good points. Well. Um, I just kind of see, I've seen a lot, too, of, um, you know, like Paul, like you talked about Paul saying everybody had turned aside from from belief I mean everybody pretty much everybody there may have been one or two and then when you talk to people sometimes <coughs> I've heard a lot of people reflect back on well the early church fathers never taught that um, people have talked about dispensationalism only being from mm -hmm. like the 19th century when in fact it's from the Word of God you know what I mean it's, right. it, it's it, the word is even in the Bible but um, you know the early church fathers didn't teach that and then you have other teachers who I think have been, you know, pastors like on the radio or whatever, who have been teaching for so long. And then the, I think there's a fear of changing anything they teach. And because I, we also know pastors who have led big congregations and they came across and understood the word rightly divided, like from a church they used to go to yeah. and, and others. And what happened is the congregation split and left. Some said, you're crazy. Some said, you know, different mm -hmm. things. And so there's, you know, just like witnessing, I mean, there's a lot, a lot of persecution, even amongst Christians to one another. And the other thing I was going to say is your mic keeps cutting out. I don't know if you know that, but oh. for, for the... It's, Maybe it's the battery. It's yeah. mostly when you're moving. Okay. It's well, it's probably not as big of a deal uh, right now, but remind me to get a new one before service starts. So thank you. Uh, and both of your points are, are, are well said. Uh, people want to put a lot of emphasis in the wrong place. You know, there's that, you know, I, a song, what is it, looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, people are looking for their theology in all the wrong places, too. There's one place that is the, that o should own your theology, and that's right here. Not anything that I say or a book says or even what somebody said in the first or second century, uh, and other than if it's in here. And so you have a... Um, I've known people who, who have directly said that, well, that was back then, so they, were, they, they probably had more of the Holy Spirit, more of understanding. And they don't get that that's just absurd. The, re, the reason why we have this is, is it's very clear. It says that the man of God may be what? Thoroughly furnished. So you are thoroughly furnished with this. If you were on an island and you didn't have a pastor or a commentator, you don't need me or Whitey or some other teacher to get all the information you need. It's right here. So, uh, Kevin, or was it George that had their hand up? Kevin? Oh, just seeing things. Okay. Uh, turn to Galatians 2. Sarah. Sarah. Sarah did. Sarah did. Oh, I knew somebody did over there. Uh, I just recall how I came to this, and the scripture that comes to my mind is that God resists the proud. Mm -hmm. I got very humbled by something that happened in my life. And, um, and then I found the scripture that said, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Mm -hmm. It was, my life was destroyed, is what happened. I was totally devastated and called out to God on my face. It was a wreck. So then I started getting understanding, but it was very humble. And, sure. Uh, you know, like you come to God like shaking and fearful, like like right now I'm recalling it, and He does, 
he does come to the humble. Sure. Yeah, and, and I, I truly believe it. I mean, my my situation was similar. Uh, I wasn't, um, you know, shaking or whatever, but I was at a place, I was at a low, and I basically said, I looked everywhere, God, but you. And I can tell you, um, the change. Uh, you know, I am a perfect example, as I said before, that God chooses choose the weak things of this world to confound the wise, the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. God, God is the one who gets glory, and so that when you don't have this, you know, uh, priest, or when you don't have this guy with all these different degrees and all this kind of stuff, um, to confound those who, who are full of pride and um, haughty. And I'm not saying education is bad or anything like that. I'm just saying that that that's that's kind of the thing. It works the way it works. And and I'll go back to something that Tim. Tim said, and, and Valerie was talking about as well, and that is the idea that, you know, it shouldn't surprise us that within one generation, the truth of rightly dividing would be lost. It shouldn't surprise us one bit. We've studied in the Names of God study where in one generation after Moses sends Joshua to take the people of Israel into into the promised land, in one generation, they forgot God and they forgot his teaching and they're worshiping idols. What can happen in one generation? So is it any surprise that second and third century writers uh, were teaching what you know, many would call as a covenant theology? Of course it shouldn't surprise us. Because again, what comes down to us is not what any of those writers wrote. It comes down to what this says. And, and that's what we study and what we should hold hold uh, as important. Kevin. It's interesting that, you know, when it says to confound the wise, you know, to, to see that word found in there, you know. Mm -hmm. Found, yeah. True. Sure. Did you have your hand up, Al? Oh, okay. Well, look, look at Galatians 2. That's your uh, next reference, although I did skip over Matthew 5.17. So if, uh, as you're turning to Galatians chapter 2, verse 1, uh, keep in mind that uh, Christ's life wasn't come, he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. In other words, to live it, not to destroy it. That wasn't his purpose. So for us, we understand that Christ was the end of the law, but the question is, when was that revealed? To whom was that given? Was that given to Peter? Was that given to the 12 apostles? No. So, but here in Galatians chapter 2, we see Paul referencing him having to go up to Jerusalem again to communicate unto them, which according to a covenant theologian, according to somebody who isn't rightly dividing between prophecy and mystery, they can't answer this question. Why is Paul having to go up 14 years after he was up before? Why did he, why did he have to go up and tell them the gospel that he preached? I mean, sure, one could say, well, you know, maybe it, was, it wasn't because they were teaching different Gospels. Maybe it was because he wanted to make sure that they understood he was teaching the same Gospel. But that's not really what we see talked about here. Paul is, is contending with these, these people. He's, he's talking about how his message is different. Um, verse 1 there, it says, Then 14 years later I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with, uh, with me also, and I went up by revelation. And communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. And so he goes on to talk about false brethren um, coming in and, and trying to spy out liberty and such like that. Um, if, you, if you continue to read on down through there, um, verse 7. What is, the, what is the result of this, this communication between Paul and, and those in Jerusalem? It says, verse 7, but contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the uncircumcision was unto Peter. And so, verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Is Paul making a distinction here? Absolutely. Pretty much obvious. He's making a distinction here. And so that's what the con uh, context is telling us. And so and in Galatians 1, verse 11, uh, he tells us where he got his message. 
It says, But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of men, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. And so he's saying, again, over and over again, Jesus appeared to me and gave me a message. This is what the message is. And so, um, look at Galatians chapter 3. Next reference in your paper there. Chapter 3, verse 1. He says, O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ hath been evidently set forth, crucified among you. This only would I learn of you. In other words, you know, I want to know. And this is what he wants to know. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by the works of the law? That's what he's asking. He's asking you foolish Galatians. Those who you want to go back under the law of, law of Moses. What's the book of Galatians is basically about. Are those who want to go back under the law. They heard the truth. They heard the message of grace. Paul had showed them the, 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 the liberty that is in Christ uh, in this day of grace. And yet they've got people who are coming in trying to tell them that they have to go under the law. And they're getting fooled into it. And he says, now, did you get the Holy Spirit by following the law? That's ultimately is what he's asking them. Or by the hearing of faith. You see, to the Jew, guess what? If you didn't follow the law, you, you weren't going to get the Holy Spirit. That was a that was a requirement, Kevin. You know, in uh, Acts 15, <clears throat> we were chapter 11. I always find it very interesting as far as the two different messages. This is where Peter says, "But we believe through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. we shall be saved." You know, mm -hmm. and we said, "We as the nation of Israel and shall be saved." You wonder, well, what, what do you mean, Peter? Aren't you saved now? Or, you know. They ask, but you got to do this to be saved. And, you know, so you, you can look at Peter's talking about a future event. Mm -hmm. A future salvation, yeah. And I think it's when uh, the nation said, ask him, well, where did he get those wounds? You know, then that's when they'll be saved, you know, when he's, um, he calls them friends. You know, but it's interesting because he says, if you blaspheme the Holy Ghost, there's no more forgiveness of sin. Sure, and that's what Hebrews is talking about quite a bit, is the idea of, um, you know, the fact that you you can't be resaved, you know. Right. The, the great news for the body of Christ is, guess what? You can't lose your salvation. Um, but in in, um, in Hebrews, it's talking about the fact that you can't um, ever be resaved. It's not suggesting you can't lose your salvation. The the Jews could lose their salvation, and so uh, matter of fact, that they had you know a remnant that, uh, situation that they were dealing with, and so. Understanding that on a basic level of rightly dividing, these are some of the basic understandings. But then as we look into more complex issues of it, uh, which to me really becomes fun. It really becomes fun to start talking about some of these more complex issues. But again, when you stick true to the principles of rightly dividing, they, they just make sense. And they, you don't have to twist and turn and, and do anything about it. Just like Kevin's pointing out, shall be saved. Well, you know, our, our, is our salvation right now in the body of Christ, is it current or is it future? Current. It's current. Our, we have salvation. You know, we are saints. I don't have to attain to it. You know, we are justified. Um, I, I am freed from God's wrath permanently. I'm not going to have to go through the tribulation period. So a lot of the versions, of, you know, that's why I like the King James, because a lot of them says, Peter says, we are saved just like the Gentiles. And that's a big difference between, yes. being, you know, even the apostle said, well, geez, well, who could be saved then, you know? He said, you're right. It's, but with God, all things are possible. And I look at it like it's even possible that they can be forgiven after blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Yeah, and Grace. those other translations, um, it's the last words of this verse is why they changed that, that uh, meaning... They change it to as a current salvation. Because if you read the last last verses, which I've already turned off there, uh, the last words of that Acts 15, 11, it says, even as they. They take that to mean the same way as. Uh, when no, it's not saying that, that they're going to be same, saved the same way as. It's we are also going to be saved. And so the King James gets it right. It's the idea there the context is talking about a future salvation, whereas we understand we already have that. 
I mean, we understand that we're complete in Christ in every which way. There is no future salvation. Yeah. So, I thought I understood it, and now I'm, I may be a, a little bit confused. So Back to Acts 15? Yeah. Um, how the Jews are to be saved in the future, mm -hmm. it's not the same as the Gentiles are saved today. Correct. So, Which is what I was saying, yeah. Okay, no, I thought, I heard, heard you say the opposite way. No, I was saying that most of the translations change the wording because they, they misunderstand those last few words. They take it as it's the same way, when in fact it's not the same way. When it says even as they, that's not saying the same way as. You shouldn't take it that way. Even as means just, you know, the fact that they're saved, we too will be saved. It's a future salvation. It's not that God has abandoned us. We too will be saved. And so, but most translations, they think of that as the same way. And so they change the wording to match what Kevin's talking about. Right. And even the New King James says, we shall be saved in the same manner yeah. as they. And I wouldn't agree with that. Yeah. We shall is right. Future in the same manner. I mean, if one really wants to get down to the nitty gritty and start talking in some some you know theology and the fact that we're all saved by faith through grace sure but it's still not the same way because i've read the book of revelation and i know it says specifically that he that endures to the end shall be saved yeah and there will be works again involved uh, right. yep yeah matter of fact we we talked about before that it says specifically that i've got a problem with you because you've been eating meat sacrificed idols paul says what about that it don't matter. Right. And, you know, words are so important. So in the, in the Galatians and 2, uh, we have a different gospel, and that's what he communicated to them. So he says, I communicated unto them that gospel, it's that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. So there's evidence right there. We have, it's a different gospel that the Apostle Paul had, sure. contrary to the gospel, the good news to Israel, to the Jews. Right, because that's what gospel is. Gospel is good news. Um, you know, that was good news, and we looked at it before, where the, where the gospel was preached to Abraham. Well, it wasn't the death, burial, and resurrection. It was that through you, that I'm going to make you a, a, a nations. I'm going to bless those that bless you. I'm going to curse those that curse you. And, and from you, all of these things are going to come. That was the good news to Abraham. And he believed God. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. And so, yeah, Don's exactly right. This is a different gospel, which we looked at last week. And we'll have to stop right here this week. Next week, the law and commissions. This is where, uh, you know, you see a lot today talking about the fact of the Great Commission. Well, the Great Commission is a Great Commission. I have no problem with the Great Commission. The problem is that's not my commission. When you look at the end of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all present a portion of the so-called Great Commission. It is not your commission. Your commission is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So, um, again, that's foreign to some people. Some people are like, wait a minute, you're taking away something I love very much. And I would just implore you, be ready, we'll see what the Scripture says. And see what they say is true. Okay, good stuff.